thank you to go ahead and turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter number 20. And we're going to begin another section on this uh, study of theology, and that's going to be on the names of God. I think sometimes it is um, a tendency that we look at some of the theological studies and we uh, begin to just find ourselves um, kind of filling our heads with a bunch of academic type knowledge. And, and the knowledge is, is good. I don't want to downplay that. There are those who uh, downplay that. That certainly is not my intent. But I also think there is a danger where it could be a very easy tendency for us to just accumulate a bunch of facts in our own minds. And when it comes to, and I've mentioned this a number of times in our study of theology proper, the study of God, I've mentioned this a number of times, and it's my prayer that we do not just simply uh, look at these things as an accrual of facts, but that we allow our hearts to be drawn more in wonder and more in awe of who God is. And if we don't do that, this study, in my mind, has not accomplished its goal whatsoever. Exodus 20 is where we'll begin this morning as we look at the names of God. And uh, I find that this is a, a reality for us that is going to uh, help us to understand who He is. And I'll say this, and just in my study of these names, what a blessing when you ponder who God is. And what a blessing when you ponder uh, what He has do done and how He has chosen to uh, reveal Himself. Exodus 20, I just want to read verse 7 and kind of use this as a springboard to illustrate the, the seriousness of the name of God. The Bible says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for thou wilt not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. We've noted in our study of the doctrine of God that what we are able to know about God is simply what he has chosen to reveal about himself. If God had not taken the initiative of revealing himself, you and I and all mankind would be incapable of knowing anything about God. But God has chosen to reveal himself in various ways, some of which we have already noted. Uh, we've observed that he has chosen to reveal himself by means of his perfections or his attributes. He's chosen to reveal himself by his works, and in so doing, he has revealed to us uh, his actions. But there's another way in which God, I believe, has chosen to reveal himself, and that is through the various names that are attributed to God within the Word of God. Within biblical culture, names were often very significant. In Western culture, we often choose names based on uh, little more than a desire of something that sounds good. Does this name have a particular ring to it? Uh, in other cases, we may use uh, a name of a relative to in some way try to honor that individual uh, and include that relative's name as part of a child's name. But in biblical times, names were often given based on their meaning. And throughout the Word of God, we find examples of names being changed to reflect a different meaning. In our study in Genesis, we just recently observed the change from Abram to Abraham. Went from exalted father to father of a multitude. The name Sarai was also changed uh, to Sarah. You find Jacob's name being changed to Israel. These name changes throughout the Word of God assumed a particular significance. I also think, and I'll throw this in as a caution, you need to be careful about reading too much into the meaning of every single name. Uh, I've heard preachers who have taken the uh, genealogies, essentially of 1 Chronicles 1 through 9, and have sought to find the spiritual meaning behind every single name. That is taking it to an extreme. Okay, And you can find yourself way off into a mess. Uh, and so there are times where there's no doubt that the meaning is intended on being drawn out. There are other times where I don't know that we can necessarily draw that conclusion. But when it comes to the names of God, I think that we can find the names to be even more significant. Because the names by which God is known throughout the Word of God are an additional means by which God has chosen to reveal Himself. And in doing so, these names reveal aspects of his nature. And these are aspects that oftentimes various individuals have come to understand and value because of certain things that have taken place. 
And so a study of these names and how they are used really becomes very insightful because what it does is it leads us to a greater knowledge of who God is. In many cases, as we'll discover, a name was attributed to God after a key event. We might say it this way, that the significance of this name was revealed to these individuals. However you want to look at it, either way, the point remains the same, that this was a place when God became very real to this individual. And it was such that now they named God with this attribute. God became personal. God became a a, a very real God to them. And not as though he wasn't, but There was a different understanding of who God is. And we'll see one, for example, when Hagar uh, was seen by God, thou God seest me. That for her at that point in time made God very real to her, made God very personal. He was no longer just a being out there. He was a being who was concerned about her. And it it changes. And you see this often as you go uh, throughout the word of God. Again, and this study is intended on uh, drawing us closer to him, help us understand more of who he is. We're not going to get into this as an exhaustive study, uh, but I want to kind of touch on some of the various aspects of the nature of God and try to uh, give us a greater understanding so that we can uh, understand him more. Exodus 20, I've already read it, but the name of God was a name that is to be regarded uh, with great significance and worth. It was a name that revealed his nature. And it was therefore not a name that was to be treated lightly. Exodus 20 and verse 7, again, uh, you're not to take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Why? Because it is a name that is sacred. Because of that, the Bible teaches that God is not going to hold him guiltless that does take his name in vain. We read in Genesis 21 and verse 33 of Abraham, who called on the name of the Lord, and in doing so, that is the equivalent of, of worshiping him. Uh, And so we find that this name is a very sacred name. And as believers, we are not to just simply have a casual disregard for it. Those are attitudes and things that we need to avoid. In the Old Testament, God is primarily known by three different names, Elohim, Jehovah, and Adonai. To these names are then added additional names that further define some aspect of his character. And we'll look at those names and then we'll examine some of the passages in which they are uh, recorded. The King James will often spell them a certain way that helps you to uh, be able to see which name it is by not having a knowledge uh, of the Hebrew itself. Let's begin by noticing this name Elohim. It is the uh, most common name for anything and any kind of deity, false as well as God. Uh, And it is the plural form of the singular, which is Eloha. Anytime you see in the Hebrew an I am ending, it's plural. So seraph, for example, would be one seraph. Seraphim would be two, okay, or at least two. Uh, Same thing with cherubim and things like that. So you see that I am ending. There's a plurality uh, that is there. Now there are times, and the the word itself I believe is used over 2,500 times uh, just in the Old Testament. Over 2,300 of those times it is a reference to God as we understand. But there are incidents where this name is a reference to false deities as well. So Elohim is not always, uh, well, Eloha, the Elohim as a, as a plural is always used of God, or it's not always used of God, it's, it's unique to the Bible, let's phrase it that way. Eloha is a, it could also be a false god, Now they may use the plural form of it, uh, various false gods that would be, you know, worshipped or something like that, so you'll see the plural form of it, but uh, when we see it in the Word of God, what you'll see it as spelled as with a capital G and then O-D. The exact meaning of it is a little bit uh, debated among some scholars. Some say that it uh, trace it back to a root that means fear and would suggest that uh, this deity is to be feared and worshipped. I would tend to suggest instead that it goes back to a word that would suggest that of strong and would suggest that God is the strong one or God is the supreme deity. That's who God is. And when we talk of God, this is who we are trying to describe. 
And what we'll find is why the plural form of it. And there are different ideas that are there. Some are just lousy ideas, and I'm not even going to include them uh, on the slides. One is that it at least allows for the Trinity. Some say, well, it teaches the doctrine of the Trinity. Not necessarily. Uh, That is a revelation that ends up being unfolded as you go throughout the Word of God. To say that, for example, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Right there you have a clear understanding of the Trinity. It allows for it. And as you read in Genesis 1, there are other clues that direct us back to the Trinity. But to say that this automatically now necessitates that uh, this is the, the reason that it was chosen, not necessarily. It clearly allows for the development of the Trinity and is one one way in which we can argue for the existence of the Trinity. There are others who would suggest that it is a term that would describe a plural of majesty. In using it this way, he would describe God with unlimited greatness or supremacy. When we see it from this perspective, we would say that God is supreme above all gods, and you find that fact to certainly be consistent throughout the Word of God. Now, we find a number of things taught about God when we use this term Elohim. Who is he? Well, number one, he is the creator. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heaven and the earth. Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 18. Thus saith the Lord, and if you'll notice, Lord is all caps, there it's Jehovah, that created the heavens, God, there's Elohim himself, that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it, he created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. I am Jehovah, there is none else. Find in Jonah chapter 1 and verse 9, I am in Hebrew and I fear the Lord the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. When we refer to God as the Elohim, we are describing in part this, or acknowledging in part, his role as creator. We are also saying by this term that he is sovereign over all. Uh, He is a God, as we have mentioned in a number of occasions, that exists in a realm that you and I simply do not understand. Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 17, for the Lord your God is a God of gods. He is supreme. There is no other God. He is Lord of lords. He is a great God, a mighty and terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. When we use the word terrible, we're using a term that would describe him as one that uh, inspires terror or awe. He is worthy of our We might say awe in that regard. In Nehemiah chapter 2, he is referred to as the God of heaven, where Nehemiah was asked by the king, what do you want? (laughs) You remember the context of this is when he was sad, and the king's like, okay, you're my cupbearer, why are you sad? Am I about to eat something that's going to kill me? Not a good job to be sad with. Well, nonetheless, uh, he's, what's the problem? And he said, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm bothered. Well, what is it that you want? The Bible says, so I prayed to the God of heaven, the Elohim of heaven. Uh, Deuteronomy, I'm sorry, not Deuteronomy. Isaiah chapter 31 and verse number 3, we find that the Egyptians are men and not God. You remember Israel often wanted to form an alliance with Egypt? Why did they want to do that? Because to them, they felt that Egypt would provide them the security. To them, Egypt would be their strong arm. They would be the one that Israel would be able to rely on. And Isaiah reminds them, the Egyptians are not God. Their horses flesh and not spirit. God is the one on whom you are to rely. Jeremiah chapter 32 verse 27. I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? 
We know the answer to that is no. Why? Because he is the strong one. He is Elohim. Not only is he the creator and is he sovereign over all, but thirdly, he is judge over all. Psalm chapter 50, the heavens shall declare his righteousness, for God, Elohim, is judge himself. Psalm chapter 58, verse 11. So that a man shall say, verily there is a reward for the righteous, verily he is a God that judgeth in the earth. Is God capable of judging all? Absolutely. Because this is who he is. You find other examples as you go throughout the word of God that it speaks of God working on behalf of the nation of Israel. And the way in which he works demonstrates that God is a supreme God. You can turn to Psalm 68. We'll be there just a little bit. But as you're turning, I'm going to read just a few verses is found in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Came to pass when ye heard the voice out of the midst of the darkness, for the mountain did burn with fire. Then ye came near unto me, even all the heads of your tribes and your elders, and ye said, Behold, the Lord Jehovah our Elohim hath showed us his glory and his greatness. Now that passage in Deuteronomy 5, where is it referring back to? What event? Remember? When did God appear before Israel? Mount Sinai, okay? And Mount Sinai and Israel, when they saw that sight, they went to Moses and said, we've heard his voice out of the midst of fire. We've seen this day that God will talk with man and he liveth. Moses, we want you to go and you tell us what he says. It was a fearful sight for them to see. Another passage is in Deuteronomy chapter 8. And then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord which thy God which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt. He did so in a miraculous way and powerful way as he demonstrated his supremacy over all of the gods of the Egyptians in every single plague. And he led them out with a strong arm, the Bible tells us in other passages. In Psalm number 68, we find a number of references to Elohim. And what we learn is there are many uh, things, and I'm not going to take the time to go through all of this passage, but I want to read just a few verses. Notice verse 1. Let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. Let them also that hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melteth before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God, of Elohim. But let the righteous be glad, and let them rejoice before God. What a difference it makes to be righteous versus wicked. The standing that is there with God. The wicked have great cause to fear. The righteous have cause to rejoice. But God is still the same. Sing unto God, verse 4. Sing praises to his name. Exalt him that rideth upon the heavens by his name, Yah or Yahweh, and rejoice before him. A father of the fatherless and a judge of the widows is God in his holy habitation. God setteth a solitary in family. Skip to verse 7. O God, when thou wentest forth before thy people, when thou didst march through the wilderness, the earth shook, the heavens also dropped at the presence of God. Even Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel. All of these terms are used to describe Elohim. And you can read throughout Psalm 68. We're not going to take time uh, to continue to do that. What you discover very quickly is that this particular psalm reflects much on who God is and the greatness that we refer to when we describe him in this way. Throughout the word of God, we also find examples where this name is compounded and there are additional uh, names that are given to God. 
And what happens often in these cases, as I read through this, is that in these various incidents, God became very real to this particular individual. God became personal in some way. But what we discover is that this God, whom we just described in these various passages, the, the earth and so forth melted in his presence, the, this God that caused a, a great fear to fall upon the nation of Israel, this God is a God that desires to be known. He is a God on whom you and I as believers can depend. Is he majestic in the sense of how we have just read about him? Absolutely. But when we look to see some of these other insights, we find out a tremendous amount about who God is. What the Hebrew will do is it will take the uh, beginning of Elohim, El, and then it will add an additional uh, suffix on the end of that, or additional name. And in doing so, it's a compound name. You find them throughout the, uh, the Word of God. They are translated for us a different way. Uh, you would obviously not read these in their he, in, in, these names in the in the in the Bible language that we've got in the English language. But what you do find, and then for the most part, the King James is fairly consistent. I can't attest to any other version uh, as far as how they do it. I know each one will will differ things, but uh, the King James is fairly consistent on how these names are going to be translated. First one I want to draw our attention to is El Elyon, uh, and it is often translated as the Most High God. It's a term that speaks of God's strength. It's a term that would speak of His sovereignty or even His supremacy. We believe the first use of it is in Genesis chapter 14 and verse 19. Uh, We saw this in our study with Melchizedek, where Melchizedek, after Abram, was victorious with the various kings uh, of the, the field and so forth. And he went and got Lot and came back. And he was greeted by this individual by the name of Melchizedek. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Here is God the first time, from what we can tell, where he is referred to as the Most High God. The only other possibility that it came before is found in Isaiah chapter 14, where we read of Satan's five I will statements. One of those statements is said to be in Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 14, I will be like the most high. Same term that's used. You might argue chronologically that Isaiah 14 took place before Genesis 14. And um, you could do so as far as when we go through the account, however, from Genesis to Revelation. Genesis 14, 19 is the first time you find it chronologically. within the, the way that the, the canonically, within the way the Word of God is, is laid out for us. Psalm chapter 9 and verse 2 uses this as well. The Bible says, I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. Let's turn ahead to Daniel chapter 7 and we find four uses of it just in this particular passage alone. Daniel chapter 7, we're into now the prophetic sections of the uh, book of Daniel, and we find a a number of insights, I think, regarding this as well. Daniel chapter number 7, and I want us to, uh, and here is a a vision, interestingly, when you take uh, Daniel 2 and compare it with Daniel 7, you find the same four kingdoms compared. Daniel 2, they are presented in a very majestic fashion. Daniel 7, they are presented in a very horrifying fashion. Daniel 2 presents those images from man's perspective. Daniel 7 presents them from God's perspective. But I want you to notice just a few of these verses, and we're not going to get into the identity of the beasts, but I want you to notice where all it is stated here in verse, uh, within this chapter. Daniel 7, verse 18, the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Drop down to verse 22. Till the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints, notice, of the Most High. 
Verse 25, he shall speak great words against the Most High. And verse 27, the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. El Elyon, the Most High God. To whom do we belong? (laughs) Well, we belong to God. Let me ask you this, is he capable of keeping you? Yes, he is Elohim. He is the strong one. He is the one on whom we can depend. There's another example, and that is found for us in Genesis chapter 16. Let's turn back to this. Uh, well, actually, you don't need to turn to it. I did pull the verse up onto the slide as well. El Royi, the God who sees. We recently studied this in our Sunday evening service. You recall where Hagar, um, where, I'm sorry, Sarai decided uh, that she and Abram needed to go ahead and, and get God's plan going in action. And reasoned that, well, I am going to be unable to give you a child, and so let me give you Hagar, my uh, servant, as your concubine. You can have a child through her, and then culturally this child will be regarded as belonging to me, to Sarai, and therefore God's promise will be good. Abram foolishly listened to the counsel of his wife. Went in, and lo and behold, Hagar conceived a child. In Genesis 16, you find that now Hagar began to look down upon her mistress, Sarai. And Sarai, of course, blames Abram for this entire thing. (laughs) Abram, this is your fault. To which Abram says, she's your servant, do whatever you want to do to her. She dealt very harshly with her. And the Bible teaches us that Hagar chose to flee the presence of Sarai. And she went out into the wilderness. It must have been, as we've mentioned already in our previous study, it must have been uh, quite a, an oppressive situation to think there would be greater safety in an uninhabited region than in the security of dwelling with Abram and Sarai and having the necessary provision. While she was there... The angel of the Lord appeared unto her and instructed her to return back to her mistress and to submit herself to her authority. In response, Hagar called the name of the Lord that spoke unto her, Thou God seest me, El Royi. Now, we can say, what does this mean in in a lot of ways? Let me point out to you, here's a reality for this lady who was a servant in biblical culture and was essentially one who had a very low status from a societal standpoint. But even on top of that, she was used by Abram and Sarai to get what it was that they wanted. To Abram and Sarai, she was nothing more than a slave that could be used to selfishly advance their own agenda. Have you ever been used by somebody? How does it make you feel? Valued? Does it give you a feeling of just wanting to do that much more for them? (laughs) Not at all. If your perception is that you are being used by somebody, you're not valued by them. Incidentally, if you use somebody, you don't value them. Here was this servant who was fleeing from her mistress and realizes that Elohim, This God whom we have described in all the various passages who created the world, who is sovereign over all, who is the judge over all the earth, who has made himself known to Israel. He is the God of all flesh, the God of heaven, the God of the earth. But he sees me. He sees what I go through. What a blessing. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. 
Isn't it amazing to think of who God is in all of his glory, in all of his majesty, in all of his splendor, and think that he sees you with your challenges, with your struggles, with your heartaches, your dreams, your ambitions, the work you do that no one else knows you do, the time you spend with him, God sees me. What a thought. There's another name, and that is the name El Shaddai, and it is translated God Almighty. The first incident of it is in Genesis chapter 17, once again a passage we studied recently. It was there that God appeared to Abram to reassure him of the covenant. The name seems to be derived from a word meaning mountain, and if that's the case, the name would suggest God's power and God's strength. It was a name that was often used to provide comfort and assurance, and many of the occurrences that we find in the Word of God relate it back to the Abrahamic covenant. Here is the first incident in Genesis 17 when Abram was 90 years old and nine. The Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, I am El Shaddai. I am the strong one, I am the the powerful one. Walk before me and be thou perfect. You see once again the parallel between who God is and how that is to translate to our actions. When we recognize the greatness of who God is and when we recognize uh, his nature, we are not to just simply remain idle and continue doing whatever it is that we are, have been doing. We are to go on and we are to advance Him. We are to walk before Him and strive to be drawn closer to Him. Throughout the Word of God, then you discover other passages that go back to the reality of the Abrahamic covenant. And it was often given to other individuals. For example, Genesis 28, verse 3. God Almighty, bless thee. And make thee fruitful, and multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude of people. Isaac. Genesis chapter number uh, 35. The Lord is speaking now to Israel, or to Jacob. In fact, his name was just changed, I believe, in the previous verse. I am God Almighty. Be fruitful, and multiply. A nation of company, or a, a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. In Genesis 35. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, when God appeared to them as El Shaddai, it brought back the reminder of the covenant that God had made with Abraham. The fulfillment of that covenant, as we will study, Lord willing, tonight in Genesis 18, illustrates the power of God. Sarah was 90 years old well past the age of childbearing. For the first time, Sarah actually hears in Genesis 18 that she will give birth to the son. Previous incidents are given to Abraham, not to Sarah. Sarah's response as she is behind the tent flap, she laughs. She couldn't help but laugh. Oh, I have to admit that if my parents came to me and said, I'm going to have a baby brother, I would laugh. Okay? Or cry. I don't know which. Uh, might be both. Uh, not because I would no longer be the youngest, but I, hey, it's just a comical thought. We all laugh at that thought. Okay? Sarah laughed. But who was it that made that promise? God. Was God capable of fulfilling that promise? Absolutely. Why? Because he is El Shaddai. I want you to ponder the implications of El Shaddai as our refuge. Psalm number 91. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He who abides in the place, and I would have to look at it and see, I just now noticed something of El Elyon probably. 
will now dwell under the shadow of El Shaddai. Is he capable of protecting you? There's the question. Yes. Because he is God. I will say of the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. One more compound name, and that is El Olam, the everlasting God. It was first used by Abraham in Genesis chapter 21 and verse number 33. It's there that we read that Abraham built an all, or planted a grove rather in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, and here's the name, the everlasting God, El Olam. He is the God of eternity, God who always is, never been a beginning, never been an ending. He's God. His nature as such is unchanging. He's an eternal being. Psalm 100 and verse 5, the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. Psalm 103 verse 17, the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting, and upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto children's children. He is unchanging in his nature. Why? Because he is El Olam. He is the everlasting God. He is not only unchanging in his nature, but he is inexhaustible in his strength. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 28. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, El Olam, Jehovah, Yahweh, the creator of the ends of the earth, Elohim, fainteth not. Aren't you glad God doesn't get tired? Neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. I don't know the challenges that you might be going through when it comes to your life, but I want to remind you that he is El Elyon, he is the most high God. You belong to him. He is El Shaddai, he is God Almighty, he is powerful and capable of doing all that he has promised to do. He is El Roi, he sees you and desires to have a relationship with you. He is El Olam. He is not limited by time. He is eternal. That is the God we serve. And that's just the name Elohim. <laughs> and there's a lot more besides this. Who is God to you? Ought to certainly be more than just advancing our knowledge of certain facts of theology. This is a person whom we serve. This is one who loves us dearly and one to whom we can pray constantly. This is an amazing God. And I hope you fall down and worship him in your own heart.